I can't decide what to make of this new product from HD Zero. Like, you're instantly going to get a sense of what the product is just by looking at it. It's a screen with an HD Zero receiver built in. It's actually a little bit more than that, and we'll go through all the things that it is and isn't here in this video. But I can't decide what to make of it, because if you're an HD Zero fan, then surely you already own the HD Zero goggles. At which point, what's your motivation to buy this screen? And if you don't already own HD Zero, then are you going to buy this screen and use it instead of goggles? Like, it's not like the Emacs Transporter, which is an HD Zero screen with a built-in kind of box goggle so you can stick it in front of your face. And yeah, box goggles don't give you the best experience, but they do give you an XPV experience. The screen, though, I'm not really sure who it's for. Maybe by the end of the video, we'll figure it out. I'm Joshua Bardwell. You're going to learn something today. It's not going to take me very long to tell you what this screen is and how it works. So let's get that out of the way before we tackle like bigger, more existential questions. It's a screen with a built-in HD0 receiver. And you can see right here, I've got an HD0 quadcopter on my desk. It's powered on and the screen is picking up the signal from that receiver. If I use these buttons here, I can change the channel. And you can see it goes all the way through the race band channels. But there's actually a little bit more going on here than just an HD0 receiver. Because I can also grab this analog quadcopter and power it up. <laughs> sure enough, it'll also work with analog video transmitters. Uh, this is a function that the HD0 display has borrowed from the HD0 race receiver. The HD0 race receiver is a box that's intended for use at like big races. It's got four receivers in it so it can listen on four channels at once and each of those receivers can automatically switch between HD0 and analog depending on which, uh, which system the racer that's on that channel is using in any given heat. That's really cool and it would be even cooler if they had built it into the HD Zero goggles. I've never really understood why they didn't do that. And I'm sure they had a good reason because HD Zero, Carl at HD Zero is a smart guy and he makes very intentional decisions about what he's going to do. But it's always bugged me a little bit that my HD Zero goggles can't do analog without having a separate analog module hanging off the side of the goggle, kind of making them even bigger and bulkier. It's always bugged me. And seeing that feature in the HD Zero race receiver, well, I went, okay, but it's a big expensive box only for racers. I get it. But now seeing that in this little display just makes me wish even more that it was in the full fat HD Zero goggles. So we've got a screen that can receive both HD Zero and analog transmissions. We've got buttons here that change us between the channels. And if we hold down this function button, we can change between the bands. And you can see that it supports race band as well as low band, A, B, E, F, basically all the analog bands, as well as the frequency bands that are supported by HD0. If I press this button, which is labeled as the return button, but I'm not sure that really means anything. If I press that button, it switches us between the RF input and the AV input. So this system does have a 3.5 millimeter AV input if you want to use it with an analog ground station or any other analog standard definition AV source. By holding down that button and pressing up and down, we can also change the brightness of the screen. On the right hand side of the unit, we have an HDMI output and thankfully that HDMI output does work the same whether the signal is digital HD0 or analog. So if you're looking for a way to receive an analog signal and transmit that over to a modern display or to an HDMI recording device, this is a, a possible solution for you. This has been one of my favorite features of the HD0 goggles ever since I got them. Way back when, before we had digital FPV systems, it was a real hassle trying to figure out how to record analog video. And yes, analog goggles all had DVR, which could record the video, but it was all kind of crappy, low quality, and you really wanted a better way to do it. Now that we have systems like HD0, which will retransmit the analog over HDMI, we can use all kinds of things like HDMI, well, HDMI capture cards to capture and record the analog with no degradation in quality, or just run it out to a bigger screen if that's something you're looking to do. 
There's a USB-C port for updating firmware, as well, if you check the quick guide that it comes with, there is also a PC app that can change a few settings like brightness, con contrast, as well as update firmware on the device. And finally, there is an SD card, which can be used to record DVR. What about the screen's refresh rate? The screen operates at 60 FPS, and that's leading some people to wonder how it's compatible with 90 FPS HD0 cameras. So HD0 has the RunCam Nano 90. It can run at 540p 90 resolution, and uh, that means you get the lowest possible latency, as low as I think like four milliseconds. But what happens when you try to display that feed on this 60 FPS screen? Well, the good news is that this monitor is fully compatible Maybe fully is too strong of a word. This monitor will display an image from a HD0 90fps camera, and it will display the image in 90fps mode. But basically what it does is it just drops one out of every three frames to take that 90fps signal down to 60fps. And that means that there is like stutteriness. And for a FPV system that is known and valued for being as low latency, as smooth and consistent as possible, that's kind of a big deal. Well, I know there's people out there that might say, screw it, I'll just fly on the stuttery 60 FPS pull down. Uh, but uh, the official recommendation from HD0 is that this is for spectating only and not for piloting. And uh, you're probably also wondering, what about the HDMI output? The HDMI output works the same. It displays a 60 FPS kind of stuttery, to, to, I don't know, is that two, three pull down? I don't know what the official term for it is, but you just take the 90 FPS, you drop one of every three frames and you get 60 FPS, and that is the result. The screen is powered by DC input from either 2S to 5S. And those of you who are using 6S batteries and don't have anything less than that are going to wish that it said 6S on the side. The HD0 goggles originally were rated 2S to 5S, and famously they changed that rating later to say, ah, it's okay, you can use 6S on it. I haven't tested this on 6S to see if it fries, I don't want to risk it, but potentially you could run it on 6S, and potentially they'll change their mind in the future, but today it says 5S, and the official advice is you're taking your your life in your hands if you go any higher than that. It can come in via an XT30 or a DC input. That's your choice. And you can see that what I've done is I've taken this little lithium ion 4S pack and I have strapped it to these lugs on the back of the unit. This is to me like one of the most, I don't know, I, I want to say, I want to be critical of this decision, but I kind of see why they did it. Because like, I wish this was a built-in battery, right? Like, obviously, it'd be better if I didn't have a battery battery strapped to the back of the freaking thing with a cable dangling off of it. And these lugs here, like, I over-tightened the battery strap a little, and I could kind of see the lugs pulling on the back panel. And I was just like, are those going to break? Is it going to come off? And then I was like, you know, if they built the battery in, well, it pulls a fair amount of power. Like, if it just was a single 18650, the battery life wouldn't last very long, and I'd complain about that. So, like, the real solution would be to have two or maybe four uh, 18650s in the back, and then it would get a lot more bulky, and I would probably complain about that. So, this is kind of a no-win situation for them. They could build a LiPo into it, and then I'd complain that it had an integrated battery that couldn't be changed, and when it wears out, the whole thing is dead. There's a no-win situation here, but part of me does want to whine about the fact that the battery, instead of it being built in, has to be, like, strapped on the back and is, like, a little bit... It's not that bad. It's not that bad. But I kind of want to whine about it anyway. So now we come to the big existential question that I posed at the beginning of this video. Who is this product for? And in order to answer that question, we have to bring the price of the product into the equation. Because, like, if it's cheap enough... I'm always a big fan of having a standalone monitor uh, on your bench. It's super handy for times when you don't want to put your goggles over your face in order to spectate somebody who's flying or just when you're working on your bench, getting your OSD set up, getting your video set up, or troubleshooting a video transmitter that you can't figure out what channel it's on. It's a great little thing to have on your bench. But if it costs too much money, then it's not like just a kind of a throwaway decision and it starts to become a lot harder to justify. This device costs, wait, before I do, ask yourself, how much would you pay for this? Get a number in your head. 
because it's going to be really easy for you to decide if the real price is higher or lower. This costs $175, and that is without antennas. Um, I have put some nice little Luminaire patch antennas on here that I had laying around. Those are not included with it. You probably have some antennas laying around. If you have to buy antennas, it could be 10 or 20 bucks, uh, and that's not going to be too expensive. But you're going to be at about $200 when you buy antennas, and if you had to buy a separate battery pack for this, if you didn't already have one, you're gonna be at another 20 or 30 bucks for the battery pack, probably. Maybe not quite that much. So, yeah, $175 to get in the door, or maybe as much as 200 or $225 if you have to buy antennas and a battery and any other accessories to get it running. And at that price, I'm not sure who this is for. Because, like I said at the beginning of the video, anybody who is a hardcore HD0 fan is going to buy the HD0 goggles and just then not really need this. Unless you want to spend $200-ish on something to use on the bench or for spectating as kind of like just a throwaway bonus. But that's kind of a lot of money to pay for like just a kind of a throwaway bonus product. If you're looking at the HD0 display, I think you have to compare it to something like the Emax Transporter 2 HD. The Emax Transporter 2 comes in at $240. And again, that's not the final price. It does come with antennas, but you may want to upgrade the antennas. And it does come with a battery, but it's not a very big battery. And it's mostly intended to run off an external battery pack. But what the Transporter 2 brings to the equation is a built-in face box goggle mechanism that allows you to use it as a primary FPV screen, whereas I just don't think you're going to be using this as a primary FPV screen. If you take it outside, it's not very bright, well, not bright enough to really be used as your primary screen outside, and most people want the isolation of goggles with the screen up against their face instead of just kind of looking at a little screen that's maybe mounted on a tripod. But what the Transporter 2 doesn't have is it doesn't have analog reception and it doesn't have all the other stuff that the HD0 screen gives you, things like the HDMI out and so forth. There's a part of me that wonders why HD0 didn't release this with a box goggle mechanism that would allow it to be used as a primary FPV display, as well as like an auxiliary handheld display for spectating and use on the bench. That's a formula that has worked really well for Emacs in the past. And although box goggles are not everyone's favorite, and usually people who use box goggles just can't afford to get the binocular style of goggles, they're still good enough that a lot of people have gotten into FPV with box goggles and find them more than acceptable. And I think at the $240-ish dollar price point of the Emax Transporter 2, this could be really compelling. But as a standalone handheld monitor, not being able to use primarily for FPV at a price of $175, I think many people are going to find it a little harder to justify. If you are one of the people who finds it easy to justify, there's links in the video description below to where you can pick it up. And they are affiliate links. And in case you're new here, what that means is that every time you click that link and then make any purchase at the affiliated store, I get a little commission. It's a small amount. It doesn't cost you anything extra. It just gives me a kickback. So it's a very easy way for you to support the channel. Before you do any of your shopping, find one of my affiliate links for that store. Click the link and go do your shopping and check out. I like this product. I think it's a good product and I'm glad to own it. I will use it. I'm just not sure that I would actually pay $175 of my own money to own it. This is the SkyZone MD5, and it's got something going for it that no standalone screen has ever had before. And if you want to learn more about that, I'll put a link to my video about this and a card on screen where you can check that out. See you there.